Welcome to Elmhurst Community Unit School District 205. A place where teaching is bold and students are highly engaged in their learning. Every student and every staff member has a story. Decisions are made based on what is best for students. Future Ready Classrooms are growing and evolving daily. Those classrooms model the four C's, the Future Ready super skills of communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity. The educational needs of all students are met, challenging each to his or her full potential and ensuring a foundation for future success in life. All means all. Rigor, relevance, and relationships form the basis of excellence. Excellence is embedded in culture. Growth is a mindset. Diversity is embraced and celebrated. Opportunities for unique expression abound. History provides inspiration. Family and community are at the core. We are committed to raising the bar to create bright futures for our children preparing and encouraging them to reach beyond their dreams. to our first annual State of the Schools Address. We are so glad you've come to be here tonight. My name is Kara Caforio. I am one of the seven school board members for District 205, and I believe five of our other school board members are here tonight. Uh, Jim Collins, John McDonough, uh, Karen, Secretary Karen Stufen, Vice President Margaret Harrell, 
and our president, Shannon Ebner. All right. As school board members, we are honored to serve our community and together continue the legacy of excellent education in District 205. Tonight's event is a first. It is the result of a recommendation that came out of our Focus 205 community engagement sessions, which began in 2015. One of our important roles as a school board is to listen and work with the community to understand their values, their priorities for our schools. As a board, we are committed to offering the community ongoing opportunities to actively participate through evolving Focus 205 efforts. We want you, the community, to help shape the future of our schools. Tonight is for you to learn about the exciting things happening in District 205 and to see what is being considered for the future. We appreciate your trust and confidence in our district as we work to prepare the next generation of students for college, careers, and life. We are very excited about the future in District 205, and we hope that you are as well. If you haven't already, please take a moment to complete the sign-in sheet on your table. After tonight's event, you will be emailed a survey about this evening and an open-ended response opportunity to give additional feedback. If you do not have an email, or a specific question about what you hear tonight, please complete one of the orange cards on your table. As you listen to tonight's pre presentation, please consider all the hard work and the contributions that our 1,100 staff members and numerous community organizations have made and continue to make towards the mission of District 205. And on behalf of the 8,400 students we serve in this district every day, thank you for investing in their future. Elmhurst's legacy of excellent education is a statement of true community. And here tonight to speak about our community is Mr. John Quigley. Mr. Quigley is the president and CEO of the Elmhurst Chamber of Commerce. He was born and raised in Elmhurst, graduating from Elmhurst College, and has worked in the Elmhurst community the majority of his life. Mr. Quigley has led the chamber for almost 20 years, building it into its third largest chamber in DuPage County and the largest organization representing Elmhurst business community. Please welcome Mr. John Quigley. Thank you and good evening. Uh, born, raised, educated, and worked most of my life here in Elmhurst. Uh, while I went to a parochial school, uh, I did go to kindergarten at Hawthorne, and I remember rolling up my little blanket and putting it in a cubby hole after we had our naps. They actually did that back then. And then I had driver's ed here at York Community High School, so I got to come over and see all my public school friends who were here. As president and CEO of the Elmhurst Chamber of Commerce and Industry, I want to uh, address briefly the importance of a quality public school system to the social vibrancy and the economic health of our community. Simply said, District 205 is an educational magnet, attracting new families and attracting new businesses to Elmhurst, while serving thousands of students from preschool through high school in a cohesive manner. Most communities have to deal with a high school district, a middle school district, an elementary school district, not Elmhurst. Thanks to District 205, the standards required of Elmhurst's numerous private and parochial educators ranks among the highest in the state, if not nationally as well. Some of you may not remember, but near the start of the new millennium, District 205 sought a $78 million referendum to rebuild the building we're in, York Community High School. And it was at a time when school referendums had failed across DuPage County for a decade. Not one referendum in not one of the 33 communities for 10 years passed. And Elmhurst was looking for 78 million to combine with 13 million in state funding. And in case you don't know it, even today, less than 25% of the property owners here in Elmhurst 
actually have a child in a public school system. It's usually around 22%, and then another 3% have kids in a private or a parochial school. So you had to convince 75% of the property tax owners that spending that money on a referendum was a good idea. Well, one of the first things the school district referendum committee did was come over to the chamber, where I had just taken over as president and CEO. And we spent months studying the referendum. And we looked at it, and we walked away from it saying, this needs to get done. It's great for the students, but we need it for the economy of our city. We need it for what it's going to do to our housing market. We need it for what it's going to do to our business market. We need it for what it's going to do to our labor market. And so we became the first organization to endorse the referendum back in 2000. And I can tell you there was a newspaper publisher who called me when we sent the press release out who said, I'm going to do you a favor and not publish this because you shouldn't be doing this kind of thing. And I said, no, this is exactly what we should be doing. This is a major economic development package in our community. It just happens to be tied to public school and our kids. But we're going to speak out for it. And a week later, they finally ran the release because they were running the referendum ads that had our endorsement in the ad as well. And I'm proud to say that we have been a strong partner of our public school system long before I took over as president and CEO. And you know, I can relate to all those property tax uh, payers, the ones who had to vote on that tough day. By the way, the committee was hoping for a 51-49 victory. That referendum won by a three to one margin. That's unheard of, especially given the time when they were seeking that amount of money. And I can relate to those voters because my property taxes have always paid for my neighbor's children to attend public school. And here in Elmhurst, that has always been money well spent and it will always be money well spent. Thank you. Tonight's State of the Schools address will be given by our superintendent, Dr. David Moyer. Dr. Moyer is an accomplished educator with 18 years of administrative experience who is committed to accelerating learning for all students. He was named an Illinois Superintendent of Distinction in 2015. As you will see in tonight's presentation, in order to improve the learning experiences for all, he is currently working to strengthen the professional learning communities throughout the district, build leadership capacity among certified staff, and challenge all to grow throughout continued learning and teaching opportunities. He is an active resident of the Elmhurst community, participating in many community events, organizations, and school functions. When he is not busy with his District 205 responsibilities, he and his wife have five children that fill their time as well. Please help me welcome our superintendent, Dr. David Moyer. Thank you, Kara, and thank you, John, for the Chamber's continued support of District 205. I uh, want to acknowledge our, our high school musicians from York. Always a treat when they come out and entertain us for these types of events. Um, and also uh, would like to thank uh, my administrative team. I think almost everybody was able to be here tonight, and um, they are really an outstanding bunch. Very proud of them. And... Um, uh, everything they do every day to make this whole thing happen. We have several teachers here I've seen tonight, and of course, you know that uh, on a daily basis, they're the ones that are doing all the heavy lifting, and so I really appreciate the fact that they came out here tonight to support us as well. And thank all of you for coming out. Um, good evening. Um, I know that all of you are busy. Uh, we all feel that kind of pressure every day, it never seems to end, and so you're taking the time to be here tonight uh, is, is something that I, it does not go unnoticed. I think there's a lot of really interesting and important information we're going to share tonight, and I hope you enjoy it. We have much to be proud of in District 205, and I'd like to start by highlighting some of the district's tremendous recent accomplishments. 
The district was awarded a Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting by the Association of School Business Officials International for the past eight years. U.S. News and World Report ranked York as the 18th best high school in Illinois and the 687th best in the nation in 2017. In 2016, Newsweek ranked York the 186th top high school in the nation. District 205 was one of 433 districts in the U.S. and Canada, um, named to the College Board's annual AP College Honor Roll. NISH ranked our district the eighth best in Illinois. In the past two years, the Communications Department garnered numerous awards from both the National School Public Relations Association and the Illinois chapter known as INSPRA. We'll see an example of that work at the end of the evening when we show our video, which received a National Award of Merit and a State Award of Excellence. Madison Early Childhood Center received an Award of Excellence for Linguistically and Culturally Appropriate Practices from the Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development. A successful Eureka math pilot led to full implementation at the elementary and middle schools. Enhanced programming at the middle schools features acceleration time, which supports intervention and enrichment opportunities for students. A new English language arts curriculum in grades K through 8 includes more opportunities for student choice and personalized learning. Expansion of the one-to-one -one mobile learning implementation featuring Chromebooks from grades 6 through 12 to include grades four through five, has resulted in more writing, collaboration, and research activities for students. And the addition of instructional coaches at all 13 schools help support teachers in their increasingly complex work. A record 13 National Merit semifinalists became finalists last spring with, with four earning National Merit Scholar status. 33 members of the York class of 2017 were named National AP Scholars earning an average score of 4.56 out of 5 on 333 exams. 53% of York students enrolled in at least one dual credit course. The Churchville Coders finished first in the nation in the Code Rush competition. York's Capitol Hill Challenge stock market team finished second in the country out of 4,288 teams. Three of the 33 students who qualified for the State Skills USA competition advanced to nationals. Four students qualified to participate in the DECA International Career Development Conference in Anaheim, California, after placing first or second in the state competitions. West Side Story was named the best production in the state at the 2017 Illinois High School Theater Awards. The top individual and team IHSA state competitors were Charlie Kern, fourth in cross country, and competitive dance, which placed sixth. And that isn't everything. So um, we all are very proud of our students and our faculty and the accomplishments that uh, we continue to see year after year. The district is committed to the moral imperative of accelerating learning for all students. The draft operational plan is to a large degree based on input from phase one of the Focus 205 process. It's constructed around three interrelated components to ensure that all students learn and grow to their maximum potential. The district has an unrelenting focus on improving student achievement. Tonight we will share some examples of this with you, including information on our two student achievement objectives, which drive school improvement and professional learning plans in the district. The district must build sustainability into its long-range financial planning. It is implementing a system of program analysis to ensure that it can determine to the best of its ability what works for which students at what cost. All decisions are made consistent with the most current educational research. There is much uncertainty at the state and federal level. And while District 205 relies primarily on local sources of revenue, an unfortunate reality is that next week the administration will present to the board a budget that reflects a $3 million operating deficit. It's not sustainable to continue to go into fund balance, and this could mean difficult decisions are on the horizon. One of the primary reasons that the plan is still considered in draft form is that more community input is needed during phase two of the Focus 205 process around the issue of facilities before the plan can be finalized. Lincoln is 100 years old. 
There are many issues with the building that adversely impact student learning, such as temperature control problems and small antiquated learning spaces. $5 million is required to keep the building afloat for the next 10 years, at which point the district will be right back in the same position it is now. Field is 87 years old. Its issues are different, but they also require attention. The York Auditorium was cut from the 2000 referendum when the project ran over budget. Five to eight million dollars worth of upgrades are required to bring it up to standard. Additional issues exist across the district, including technology infrastructure, a need for safety and security improvements, air conditioning, and other improvements to ensure equity exists in the opportunities and programming for all students. The community expressed a desire to explore adding all-day kindergarten, which has facility implications. The good news is that there are options available to address these issues that will not result in an, in, in taxes, in an increase in taxes for the owner of a median-priced home in Elmhurst based on current home values and interest rate projections. However, it is ultimately up to the community to decide what, if anything, it is willing to support in regard to addressing these and other district facility needs. It is important to note that in this plan, no decision will be made in a vacuum. In other words, budget and facility decisions will be made in the context of what most positively impacts student learning. As a national leader in future ready learning, the district aims to ensure that all students graduate college, career, and life ready. The mission of accelerating learning is supported by four core beliefs. They are all students must learn and grow. We accept shared responsibility for student growth. We make decisions based on what is best for students and we are a future-focused community of learners. Culture, student experiences, and instructional strategies are principles that guide the practical work that brings the belief statements from words on paper to reality for students. Excellent teaching and leadership at all levels of the organization, combined with a supportive and engaged community and professional expertise and data, are necessary for these three principles to be fully realized. This graphic visually illustrates the philosophical foundation upon which the details embedded in the plan were established. In my blog, superchat205.blogspot.com, which is accessible through my superintendent's page, I regularly, regularly address various elements of future ready learning and district priorities. In July, the board approved two student achievement objectives, ensure student growth through a balanced assessment system and increase student engagement in all grades EC12. These are included in the student achievement section of the draft plan. You can also access more deal, detailed information about them on my webpage. Additionally, the draft plan, uh, an abstract of the draft plan is available online uh, from the July regular board meeting when it was presented uh, to the community for the first time. Balanced assessment essentially means that teachers must have real-time information on student learning in order to make informed instructional decisions and for students to understand the next steps in their learning progression. It is our belief that student engagement drives everything. While content is still important, in a learner-centered environment, students create knowledge and learning becomes more about what students can do with what they know as opposed to only being about what they know. At this time, we're going to share some examples of how these big ideas are reflected in the daily work of our professional educators. It's my pleasure to introduce York Principal Aaron DeLuga and Madison Principal Susan Condrat. Hello, I'm Susan Conrad, I'm the principal of the Madison Early Childhood Center, and this is Erin DeLuca, who's the principal over at York. We're just going to spend a couple of minutes talking to you and giving you the basics of what professional learning communities are and what they can do for our schools. Professional learning communities are present in all of our schools, starting with our youngest learners at Madison and going all the way through York High School. Professional learning communities are groups of administrators and staff that are united in their commitment to student learning. These groups are powerful for staff development, which leads to change and improvement of schools. PLCs and buildings support the district visions of culture, student experiences, and instructional practices as they provide staff with a common focus that is really focused on the students and what they're learning. 
and that also focuses on building relationships while improving instruction and the experiences for all of our students. The four questions that drive the work of PLCs are, what do we want our students to learn? What do we expect from them to learn? How do we know that they're learning? How will we respond when they don't learn? And what will we do then when they already know the content? These guiding questions have enabled Madison's PLCs to determine power standards for our youngest learners that are the expectations for the student learning. We've developed common assessments that are observation-based and provide us with information on student learning. And we also provide weekly time to focus on in our response to learning by discussing ways to assist students that are not, that are struggling and to accelerate, the, accelerate for students that, are, who, that already know the content and to ensure that students are engaged and continually, continually learning throughout the process. I will now turn it over to Erin who will discuss the work at, in York PLCs. While it really can be different Depending on the students' age levels, it's really all the same when you look at it because we're focused on what the students are learning and how to best serve them through the work that we do together as a community. Thank you, Susan, and thank you everyone for having us here tonight. It's an honor to talk a little bit about what we're doing at York. So again, Susan mentioned that professional learning communities by definition are a collegial group of administrators and school staff who are united in their commitment to student learning. And that really is the foundation of professional learning communities um, from early childhood through senior year for our students. At York, we work explicitly to ad address student growth and success through tightly aligned professional learning communities and a scoped and sequenced curriculum. At York, we've done this by adhering to two building goals um, that are tied to growth and opening access to careers, both tied to the district objectives. Uh, the characteristics of professional learning communities that we find valuable are shared values and vision, collective responsibility for pupils' learning, reflective inquiry, collaboration focused on learning, groups as well as individual professional learning, openness, networks and partnerships, inclusive membership, mutual trust, respect, and support of each other from a staff perspective and certainly with our students. You know, the impact on our students at York, it's been extraordinary. Because these meetings are student-driven, student-focused, data-driven, and data informs all of the instructional practices that are put in place, kids are becoming more vigilant, critical thinkers, excellent problem solvers, and they know that we believe they can grow. I think the power is the potential for maximizing student growth from our early childhood center to York um, and knowing that as a community we've embraced that. I think that that's what sets us aside from other districts in this state. And my mantra at York to staff, to the parents, community and the kids especially is I believe that I can meet the needs of each student and help them grow and I know that I have an incredible staff working every day to do that. So I think with that in mind that's the power of professional learning communities. Thank you. Thank you both. And um, next up is Fisher Principal Jane Bailey, instructional coaches Katie Murphy and Sharon Emmy Ivanelli, and classroom teacher Jamie Gableman. So I was fortunate enough in 2016 to attend the Model Schools Conference, which gave some um, awesome information about the future of education in our world and how things need to change. And so um, our fourth graders last year were reading a book and um, I'm watching it and listening to kids talk and teachers talk and I thought, this is it, we could design toys. How cool would that be? And so we got some motors and batteries and bulbs and things from Radio Shack and kind of put them on the table and said, okay guys, we're going to design some toys. Most people looked at me and thought, okay then. They did, they invented toys. There's going to be a clip of it in a few minutes. And we thought, that, well, that was pretty awesome. What happens if we apply this to summer school? So summer is a time for um, uh, maintaining skills more than student growth. We meet three hours a day. Um, we meet four days a week and we meet for five weeks, so there's not a lot of time to see great growth. What happens if we take the ideas of future-focused learning and put them in summer school and break almost all the traditions you can think of? So we had 
mixed age groups. We had first and second graders working together. We had third through fifth graders working together and making choices about what they were gonna learn about. So we had um, architecture and structure for first and second graders, they met an architect. We had um, the uh, space camp for first and second, how do craters form and what's it like on the moon and what's the order of the planets. And they all did it by experiential learning. In fifth grade, we had the food chain from farm to table. They had a garden, which was amazing, both inside and out. Again, you're gonna see pictures of it. We also did um, extreme weather. Phil um, Schwartz came in and answered the student questions about weather and why. And it was incredibly powerful learning. And so I'm gonna turn it over to the teachers who actually did the work and so Sharon Emmy Avenelli is going to talk a little bit about the role of um, technology and her role supporting student learning. Thank you. Um, summer school is always one of my favorite times of the year at Fisher. Um, there's a creative and curious energy um, that exists among the students. And we get to indiv individualize instruction even more um, with our low student teacher ratio. Um, we see curious learners develop before our eyes. So in my role as instructional coach this year, um, our librarian, Donna Dewar, and I decided to kind of support our teachers in a little different way by helping them plan instruction, gathering resources, integrating technology, and especially promoting um, inquiry within our new innovation station. Um, this was fortunate for me because I got to learn with students from K through five as they explored many topics that Jane talked about earlier. It's simply inspiring to see children think, question, converse, read, write, explore, just like real scientists, engineers, and architects. We attempted to fill their mornings with opportunities that built background, stamina, and perseverance every day. I was able to witness the words, I can't, turn into I can, too many times to count. Some highlights from our youngest learners included clarifying what actually can grow in a garden. Yes, one kindergartner insisted we plant goldfish crackers, <laughs> and we were able to clear up that misconception through hands-on gardening and experiences that promoted understanding of how plants really grow and feed us. One of my favorite moments of summer school was witnessing some first and second graders struggling with making a tall skyscraper out of toothpicks and marshmallows. Several students discovered on their own that triangles were holding up better and allowed them to stack them higher and higher. How exciting for these students when a few days later, architect and York parent, Michael Zanatis, came to show students how architects plan buildings. These students were able to have their hypothesis validated by a real architect. Yes, triangles are in used in structure for strength, learning by doing, and that is summer school at Fisher. So this school year, we're continuing to plan with teachers and look for ways to incorporate organic inquiry into our lesson plans. We want all of our students to experience the same sense of accomplishment as our summer school learners have done. We know the world of tomorrow is very different from today. Dreamers, thinkers, and creators are needed. It is great to be part of a district that sees future-ready learning such as this as a priority. Thank you. Next is Katie Murphy, and Katie serves as the instructional coach at Field Elementary. Yes, we had some people from other schools come over. And Katie is the one that did architecture and structure with first and second. So I was fortunate enough this summer to work at Fisher um, during summer school, and I worked with first and second grade. Uh, I co-taught with a Spanish-speaking teacher, so we were able to accommodate all the needs in our classroom. Our focus on, was becoming an architect. We would start our day with doing a read aloud as a whole group, and then from there we would go into small groups creating different types of architects. We created log cabins, homes, schools, skyscrapers, pyramids. We would give the students all different types of materials 
and very little guidelines and have them build their own structures. It was amazing to see what the students would get from just giving them a few different materials and them learning from their own mistakes. The most important thing that I think the students learned from summer school was that it was okay to make mistakes and that we learn from our mistakes and that's how we become learners. Um, some of my favorite highlights from summer school were that we were able to bring in people from the community we were able to bring in an architect that was able to show the students real blueprints and how to create their own structures. We were able to bring, we were able to Skype with somebody who built homes in different countries. And my favorite was when we brought in some, um, a man named Drew Edwards who was building schools in Uganda and the students were able to see how the schools were built in different countries. And then from there, they were able to create their own schools using different materials. Who knows, some of these students will not, might not ever become architects, but I do know that we created a learning experience for these students that they will never forget. And finally, Jamie Gableman, first grade teacher at Fisher, who did the space camp. So for summer school, I worked with incoming first and second graders, and I co-taught with a Spanish um, speaker teacher. Um, the students were able, not only able to learn about outer space and astronauts, but they were also able to learn about architects, as the architects also learned about outer space, because we switched classes halfway through the day. Um, at space camp, the students were able to learn about planets in our solar system. We learned about uh, the sun and how it's the boss of the universe. We learned about the moon and how it gets craters by um, throwing wiffle balls at shaving cream moons. We were able to um, we were able to attend space camp, so we had uh, actually activities set up in the gym one day, and the kids had to like put together puzzles with big gloves on, and they had to jump over things and through things. Um, and the last thing that we did was we built uh, the International Space Station with Legos, with no instructions at all. Um, I'd just say it's so gratifying to see the children so excited about learning, and I'm hoping to do more of it this year with my first graders. Um, I told you we broke some rules, and so here's the big rule that we broke. For those that don't know, um, Fisher is highly diverse, and many, many, many of our kids speak a language other than English. So in each of our classrooms, we had an English teacher paired with a Spanish teacher, and everyone learning side by side because we could communicate in either language, answer questions, provide directions and support. So it was an amazing summer. Thanks for your attention. So we're trying to uh, debunk the myth that um, school isn't supposed to be fun. And today I went to uh, Edison School, and this was just random, one of my school visits. And um, I go into the library, and the kids that are coming down for the library, all the kids now are fascinated with hurricanes right now for obvious reasons. So um, they're, doing, they're doing an activity in the library where they had to try to... Uh, learn how to create a structure that would withstand a hurricane. So the hurricane, they had these spray bottles and hair dryers, and they were going to be trying to blow these, these structures over and see which ones would stand up the best. And, and uh, um, I was thinking to myself, I wanted to play along and see how that went. But um, So now we're going to welcome uh, York English Department Chair Kevin Podeska and Social Studies English Department Chair Mike DeNovo. Evening, everybody. If we move to the side, can you still see us? Is that okay? All right, thanks. All right, so my name is Kevin Podeska, English Department Chair. This is Mike DeNovo, Social Studies Department Chair. Um, perhaps the best way to begin our segment here on interdisciplinary learning is with a story. But it turns out that Mike is a much better storyteller than me, so I'm going to turn it over to him. I'm not quite sure if that's... Uh 
not quite sure if that's actually true. Kevin could tell a really good yarn. Um, but I'm going to tell the story of one interdisciplinary forum. Um, it begins with something that we've been doing in the social studies department uh, for about eight years now, as we've been celebrating Constitution Day, um, which is uh, the, the annual date to commemorate the signing of the Constitution. We've been uh, celebrating it with uh, bringing in a guest speaker. Uh, the guest speaker typically talks about aspects of the First Amendment. Um, it was something we did in the social studies, and so it was something that our sophomores experienced in government. Um, it's typically around the end of July or early August where I start thinking about, um, well, who were, who's going to speak? And... Um, I send a message to the department to see if they've come across any good speakers, and I'll, I'll get suggestions that way, and I have a list of organizations that I've talked to in the past. And uh, so I was beginning that process in early August, and I kind of had this like thought uh, that I was going to check with Kevin to see if uh, maybe we could try something, try something new, uh, to maybe extend the Constitution Day guest speaker a bit. Um, so I went to work on finding a guest speaker, but in the meantime, I said to Kevin, uh, typically the speaker talks uh, about the First Amendment, some aspect of the First Amendment, freedom of speech or religion or something, and uh, it, what, are the, what are your teacher, what are your students in English 10 reading at that time? The upshot of the whole thing is we wanted the experience for our students to be more than just attending a guest speaker. The guest speaker has always been an enriching experience for the students, but we knew we could do more. And that was the premise on which Mike reached out to our department to ask the simple question, can we do more to craft a more enriching learning experience for our students? And the answer to that was yes. When I proposed the idea to our sophomore English teachers, they immediately saw the relevance and the relationship between what kids were learning in their English class, what they were learning in their American government class, and what they were going to hear from the speaker, Ari Cohn, who was just here this past Friday. All right, so in crafting that experience, it required us to have to look at the way that we design curriculum differently. In other words, we had to move away from a more siloed, isolated approach to how we think of what our kids learn to something that emphasizes the relationships between what they learn. That includes not just ideas, but also the skills they learn and the critical thinking skills that they develop across all of their courses. If there's one enemy working against us and helping to exact more student growth, it's fragmentation and isolation. And we know that we need to take steps to remedy that. And these are the steps that we're taking to do that. So the forum is an experience. It's a moment in time where the kids live that relationship but it's only possible if we design the whole thing to do that on purpose. We can't make that an accident. So uh, on Friday of last week, we had this uh, guest speaker from the FIRE. That's the Foundation for uh, Individual Rights in Education. And uh, students in second, third, and fourth hour um, attended, well, students from all periods attended a presentation in one of those periods. And... Uh, and they heard our, our speaker use uh, the events of Charlottesville uh, from the end of the summer uh, to help kids see where the limits of free speech are. All right? uh, what can be said, what cannot be said, when should the government step in to uh, defend others, uh, the security of others. All right? and, and so that's what's taking place already. And Kevin, would you talk about what's going to take place next week? So you're going to love this. Here's what's happening next Tuesday. This is going to be happening in the learning commons, which you can see up in those windows over there. All of our sophomore students are going to spend the period they would normally have English in the learning commons, taking what they learned from that presentation from Mr. Cohn, the texts they are currently reading in their English course, and some content from American government 
We're going to synthesize all of that together and then give the students an opportunity to apply that synthesized knowledge to a series of very real, very relevant issues dealing with free speech and the limits of government. So it's a very, um, shall we say, real world application of what it is that they're learning across multiple content areas. Right. So Ari Cohn gave our kids a lens for which they could judge um, free speech and they and he used the Charlottesville incident. And so uh, we got together in a room with some government teachers and a, f and a few English 10 teachers and we started throwing around other diff other ways that we could test student ability to navigate that uh, that very tense issue. So we came up with ideas uh, related to art and music and speech online. And these will be the uh, issues that the kids uh, wrestle with next week. And they'll be in small groups, mm -hmm. so they'll be able to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's all levels, all levels of kids. Mm -hmm. So w regardless of what, uh, if they're in uh, gen ed or mm -hmm. any sort of uh, honors level, uh, they are going to experience that same so that's that same interaction. Yeah. And if you want to see an example of what that looks like, just take a look at the screen. That is an image of a forum that we did last year that was based on the same premises, different topic, but it was interdisciplinary. It involved a synthesis of many things that students learn. And you can see that it provides them with an opportunity to interact with each other in a way that simply cannot be duplicated in the classroom. If there's one takeaway that we want you to have, from all of this, it's not so much that we want you to think the forum is cool, because it is cool, at least we think it's pretty cool. Um, it is that we want to do more of this. This is the kind of experience that embodies what Dr. Moyer began with, which so many spoke of before we ever got up here. It's all the idea that what we do best, we do together. And that means that we need to set things up so that teachers can work together in the service of bearing out those relationships and what kids learn. It's about the real world, so it's relevant. Uh, it's dealing with complex issues, so it's rigorous. And uh, it's teachers and kids working together in, in a very unique way, uh, so it's about relationships. And so uh, we're excited about this one, and we're planning to do some more. Maybe we'll see you Tuesday. Thanks. Okay, th thanks guys. Thanks to all of you for sharing your stories. As Kara mentioned, phase one of Focus 205 was a two-year community engagement process. It featured six large group interactions, active sessions, focus groups, a survey, and educational alignment study of district facilities, and culminated last spring when the facilitating team issued its report to the board. Several of those recommendations have been implemented or are in the process of being implemented. The community expressed a strong desire for increased STEM opportunities for students. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. However, while these content areas are important, STEM is more about a mindset of interactive, interdisciplinary, problem-based, real-world learning experiences. The Fisher Summer School and York Interdisciplinary Forums are examples of this. Another example is Project Lead the Way which we will hear more about shortly. The district's goal is to implement this at the middle school level beginning in the fall of 2018. Dual language also emerged as a priority and planning is also underway for implementation in 2018. This will also be addressed shortly. The district has added instructional coaches at all of its schools and acceleration time will systematize interventions and enrichment practices in grades one through eight. Early childhood and the high school are addressing this in different ways. I discussed some of the district's pressing facility needs earlier, which will be the primary phase, or the primary focus of phase two of Focus 205. The community indicated an interest in pursuing the feasibility of adding all day kindergarten. The district is studying this issue, and currently all but one of our eight comparable districts and 60% of DuPage County districts offer the option of all day kindergarten. 
Advantage, advantages of all-day kindergarten are students gain language and literacy skills fa faster than students in half-day programs. Social, emotional, and behavioral skills are enhanced, and there are additional opportunities for free play and experiential learning when essential academics are not compressed into a few short hours. This can mean a decreased need for remedial and intervention services, and the achievement gap narrows because at-risk students have enhanced opportunities. Any decisions related to all-day kindergarten will factor into the facility's planning process. Phase 2 of Focus 205 began with the district welcoming Dr. Bill Daggett of the International Center for Leadership and Education to Elmhurst to deliver the opening keynote to our faculty and facilitate a program for the community in the evening. It continues with tonight's presentation. It will include polls, focus groups, surveys, and other additional means to share information and solicit feedback. As I mentioned, Project Lead the Way and Dual Language are in the planning stages for implementation for next year. So I would like to introduce Dr. Mark Cohen, Assistant Superintendent for Innovation and Growth, and Dr. Mary Henderson, Assistant Superintendent for Learning and Leadership Development, who will share some specific information on these two programs. Good evening. My name is Mark Cohn, I'm Assistant Superintendent for Innovation and Growth, and I'm pleased to just take a few minutes to talk to you a little bit about Project Lead the Way. The Project Lead the Way program is a series of STEM modules, units, or courses available for, for elementary, middle, and high schools, respectively. According to the U.S. Department of Commerce, job opportunities in STEM occupations are projected to grow at a rate of 17% year over year in the next 10 years. STEM degree holders, have higher incomes even if they work in non-STEM careers. And STEM education helps to bridge the ethnic and gender gaps sometimes found in math and science fields. Having a solid background in STEM fields like the opportunities available through Project Lead the Way help create a generation of critical thinkers to increase scientific literacy and enable our young innovators. District 205 is currently working on the development of Project Lead the Way programs in grades 6 through 12. The middle school program from Project Lead the Way is called Gateway, and it's made up of 10 smaller modules that can be put together in a variety of combinations, where the high school programs fall in three distinct pathways, engineering, biomedical science, and computer science, and we'll be looking to implement those as part of the growing pathways that the high school is currently putting together. Project Lead the Way is currently in all 50 states, and serves over 10,000 K through 12 schools across the country. In each state, Project Lead the Way has college and university partners that assist with curriculum development and training. In Illinois, in Illinois those partners are Benedictine University, the University of Illinois Chicago, and the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. Corporate partners include Chevron, Verizon, 3M, Toyota, John Deere, BMW, just to name a few. The activity project and problem-based design centers on hands-on real-world activities, projects, and problems that help students understand how the knowledge and skills they develop in the classroom can be applied in everyday life. Students learn through structured activities and projects that empower students to become independent in the classroom and help them build skills that they can apply to an open-ended design problem. Students show what they've learned by completing classroom activities, projects, and problems by maintaining logs, notebooks, and portfolios that undergo rigorous assessment and evaluating work through a range of tools, such as performance rubrics and reflective questioning. It's also partnered with the College Board to encourage student participation in STEM courses and build their interest in STEM careers. The AP Plus Project Lead the Way program leverages the success of the College Board's Advanced Placement Program and Project Lead the Way's Applied Learning Programs to provide students with the challenging coursework that they need to be prepared for college and career. This year, curriculum work will begin on Project Lead the Way. Courses will be developed for launch at the middle schools in the fall of 2018. The middle school curriculum will continue to be developed over the next three years for all three years of our middle school students. 
Project Lead the Way programs will begin to be offered at York High School in the fall of 2019 as a part of the college and career pathways, again, that I mentioned that are under development. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm pleased to be here tonight to talk to you about dual language programming. Uh, we will be launching dual language at Fisher Elementary School in the fall of 2018. And I'm going to talk specifically about that type of dual language program. So dual language at Fisher will be considered a two-way immersion program in English and Spanish. That means that a classroom is comprised of 50% native English speakers and 50% native Spanish speakers. And the goals for outcomes of the program are that all students will be bilingual, biliterate, and bicultural in both English and in Spanish. The program serves two purposes. For our native Spanish speakers, it provides solid um, research-based instructional practices that meet their bilingual needs in order to become proficient in English. For our native English speakers, it's an enrichment opportunity as they begin the study of a language in kindergarten and are fully immersed in it. The way model is set up for dual language with two-way immersion uh, will be a, an 80-20 model. That means that in kindergarten, the students will spend 80% of the day receiving their instruction in Spanish, and 20% of the day they will receive instruction in English. Um, that model continues to progress until by fifth grade, when the students are spending half of their day with instruction in Spanish and half of the day with instruction in English. As students progress from elementary school to, to middle school, they typically take um, half of their English course content in Spanish, as well as another content area, which is typically social studies or science. As students then move on to high school, they have the opportunity to typically take uh, a more immersive culture class in Spanish, and then that typically sets them up well to be ready for the AP Spanish test. From there, they could progress to other dual credit types of opportunities through um, our partnerships with College of DuPage or Indiana University. One of the real benefits of dual language programming is the academic impact for our, our students. Uh, studies show that while initially, such as in third grade when we begin standardized testing for our students, initially those scores may seem to appear lower than students who are in a traditional monolingual classroom because they've had so much heavy instruction in Spanish. However, what you find with a dual language program is by the end of elementary school, our students, both native Spanish speakers and native English speakers, are typically outperforming their peers who are in a monolingual program in both reading and in math. Another benefit of a dual language program is that preservation of Spanish for our students who are native Spanish speakers. Currently in programs where the emphasis is on the development of reading skills in English and writing skills in English, the Spanish literacy skills are minimized and don't become fully developed. In a dual language program, they do become fully developed and this sets our native Spanish speaking students up well for future careers where they are truly bilingual and biliterate. Thank you. So thank you uh, for sharing that with us. In Elmhurst, we believe strongly that culture trumps strategy. As a national leader in future-ready learning, it is paramount that the culture of District 205 is that of a culture of innovation. In this type of culture, risk-taking is rewarded and failure is redefined as a way to learn and grow. Our administrators know that we must model this ethos every day. At the opening Administrator Academy in August, the senior leadership team participated in a Mentimeter activity in which they were asked to list the three words that best describe what innovation means to them. This is the word cloud that resulted from that activity. We intend to work uh, to continuously improve upon our strengths and our current practices, while at the same time dream big and take the essential risks required to innovate and do things that never before seemed possible. And this is the Elmhurst experience. 
Welcome to Elmhurst Community Unit School District 205. A place where teaching is bold and students are highly engaged in their learning. Every student and every staff member has a story. Decisions are made based on what is best for students. Future Ready classrooms are growing and evolving daily. Those classrooms model the four C's, the future ready super skills of communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity. The educational needs of all students are met, challenging each to his or her full potential and ensuring a foundation for future success in life. All means all. Rigor, relevance, and relationships form the basis of excellence. Excellence is embedded in culture. Growth is a mindset. Diversity is embraced and celebrated. Opportunities for unique expression abound. History provides inspiration. Family and community are at the core. We are committed to raising the bar to create bright futures for our children, preparing and encouraging them to reach beyond their dreams. So that concludes our evening. Thank you for coming and visiting with us tonight. Remember that uh, to, to please share your information with us. And uh, if you choose to do that, we will send you a link that where you can give us uh, some feedback and share some comments about this evening's presentation. If you prefer to write some comments, there, there are, is an opportunity for you to do that. We have something set out at your table for you uh, if you prefer that. Thank you again. We appreciate it. And thanks to all of our presenters uh, for a great evening. Welcome to Elmhurst Community Unit School District 205. A place where teaching is bold and students are highly engaged in their learning. Every student and every staff member has a story. Decisions are made based on what is best for students. Future Ready classrooms are growing and evolving daily. Those classrooms model the four C's, the future ready super skills of communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity. The educational needs of all students are met, challenging each to his or her full potential and ensuring a foundation for future success in life. All means all. Rigor, relevance, and relationships form the basis of excellence. Excellence is embedded in culture. Growth is a mindset. Diversity is embraced and celebrated. Opportunities for unique expression abound. History provides inspiration. Family and community are at the core. We are committed to raising the bar to create bright futures for our children preparing and encouraging them to reach beyond their dreams.